Welcome everybody. How was that opening presentation? That was pretty impressive. I've had the fortune of already hearing the Colonel speak and it's it never gets old. She was she's awesome. Um, so my name is Chris Mazzella. I want to welcome you to the CFES New Beginnings National Conference for 2022. And we have our guests, which I'm going to have them introduce themselves in a little bit. But I also want to introduce our audience to our guests because we're fortunate we have students from uh, two schools that are not too far away from uh, Bolton Landing from Ticonderoga. You guys want to give a big fist bump, Joe Sentinels, okay? Um, and Crown Point, and the Panthers are represented, okay? And then before we get started, are there other schools that are represented here as far as faculty or teachers, science teachers, STEM teachers that signed up that want to just give a shout out where you're from? No, we have the Wyoming team here. Okay, anybody else? Clearwater, Florida. Clearwater, Florida. Anywhere else? The Bronx, New York. Florida. Troy, New York. Uh, Utica, area. Utica, Utica, New York. <laughs> Van Horn, Texas. Okay. All right. Everybody else is. Part of our part of our student gear up program. Okay, so as I had mentioned earlier, my name is Chris Mazella. I am a CFES program director. I'm a retired high school principal, um, but my background was initially math and physics, and I taught physics for a long time uh, before I became a principal. Um, we have the great opportunity to engage with West Point's astrobotic team and the technical director of a company called SAIC, which is a research scientific company, and they do a lot of work with NASA, space exploration, and we are going to hear about careers of the future and some of the things that you may be wondering about, where are we going beyond the moon in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years? So the opportunity for our students to listen to, to experts, talk to some pretty cool college kids to get an idea of what it's like to go to a military academy, but also what it's like to be on a team and what it's like to just manage college itself. So if we, I'd like to start with our guests from West Point. Sam, if you can start and then we'll have Chris, you can introduce yourself. All right, uh, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Samantha DeMonte. Um, I'm originally from Maryland. But now I am currently at school at West Point, which is up in New York, if you're not familiar with it. Um, so I graduated high school back in 2019, which makes me a senior now. There's about 201 days until I graduate and enter the Army. Um, but during my time at West Point, I've really had the opportunity to do a lot of really amazing things. Um, academically, I've been able to study physics along with a pre-med track and a nuclear engineering track. I've had the opportunity to do research in quantum sensing and I've been able to explore a lot of uh, different space facilities and work on some pretty cool research projects at the national lab. Um, so yeah, it was great to be here with you guys today. Thank you, Sam. Chris, welcome. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Christopher Fresnel. I'm a junior here at West Point. I originally came uh, hail from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, go Tigers! Um, uh, uh, <laughs> yes, sir. Great win. Uh, I'm currently so again. I'm currently a junior. Uh, I study nuclear engineering. Uh, it's probably a great opportunity to kind of explore what I am interested in, um, kind of the radiation technology, but also working here joining astrobotics. I'm able to put that into use. Um, and work with a bunch of great people. Um, I'm also I'm a squad leader, so I lead a group of six people uh, and make sure that they're all taken care of and that they are uh, good to go here as cadets. Uh, uh, I like to do a lot of stuff here, so I like to lift. Um, and I like to hang out. Um, and West Point's been quite a great opportunity to me. Uh, it's given me a lot of failures, a lot of successes. Um, and the failures have really helped me learn to become a better person um, and how to become a better leader and do things just in generally like better. Um, 
Um, I'm about another year and a half uh, before I graduate and join the Army, uh, but I'm excited. I'm excited uh, to finish out. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Hi, Juan. I think you're still muted. Yes, sorry. Hello, my name is Juan Roman Velasquez, and I am from Puerto Rico. So, uh, hola, for those of you who speak Spanish. I am, uh, let's see, I graduated from engineering school a long time ago, a bachelor degree in mechanical engineering. And then I did my PhD in systems engineering, basically integrating all the multidiscipline uh, aspects of space systems. I started uh, working at NASA, Goddard Space Flight Center, when I graduated from uh, university. And then throughout my career at NASA, I started as testing flight uh, satellites. And uh, at the end, after 32 years, I retired from NASA as a senior executive responsible for the entire engineering directorate of almost 3,000 engineers. And now I work for SAIC. I'm the technical director and the space science and engineering director at SAIC. Uh, and I love space and I'm excited to share some of the things that we're doing and uh, what the future takes and brings in space to all of you. Thank you so much. Um, and we're gonna start with the astrobotics team from West Point. They're gonna share some of their experiences. They're actually gonna talk a little bit about essential skills because we have so many students here. Um, we heard Chris talk about some of the failures that are making him a better leader. Um, and they're going to share their experience because this team also competes with other colleges around the country in NASA competitions. Okay, so um, I'm going to turn the, the slideshow over to you, Sam. Go right ahead. All right. So some of you may be wondering why me and Chris are sitting here with you guys today. Um, and that's largely because we're part of the Army Astrobotics team, which I guarantee none of you are familiar with. So we, uh, we're a robotics team, kind of super nerdy, um, and we compete in a NASA robotics competition called Lunabotics, which is focused on building a robot that can mine material from the moon. Um, so me and Chris personally aren't doing the robotics. We're not one of these cool guys you see on the screen who's building the robots, talking to the astronauts. What we do is we get our name out there. We get our research out there. We engage with you guys. We um, and try and get you excited about NASA, excited about robotics, excited about um, just science in general. Uh, so last year we partnered with CFES and we're able to work with about 150 students um, on different STEM related activities. And we're doing the same thing again this year. So up on my screen right now, you can see uh, a couple images of the team at the competition last year. So we were invited down to Kennedy Space Center to compete in the competition after some preliminary kind of requirements that they picked 50 of the schools from and then they took us down there and we were able to compete in the competition um, and that came along with some pretty cool opportunities they got to this bottom right picture they got to tour the facilities pretty in depth they even got to see the um, Artemis rocket which will be in the video I'm about to show you and then over here on the left they got to meet some astronauts talk to a lot of the people working at Kennedy Space Flight Center. And then of course, down there in the corner, you can also see the robot that we put together and built, which is super cool. Um, but to just show you a little more of what we did or what they did really, I guess, um, is if it'll ever switch, is I have this video showing you uh, our robot in action. And it doesn't have any sound in it. So I guess I'll just narrate as it goes. Um, so we're this one down here with the red scoops in the, the green wheels. This is uh, Dan and Garrett navigating it through the terrain. So they're the ones driving it through the dirt. 
taking it around the rocks from the start end to the mining end. And then in a minute, it'll transition over. Oh, there's Pat talking to some astronauts. And here you can see over on the left, as we start mining away, a little less efficiently than the people next to us, I guess, but hey, it was our first year. So we were pretty satisfied with how our results turned out. And then like this, we got a tour of the Artemis rocket. Um, so we get to do some pretty cool stuff. And sometimes wearing the uniform that we get, that we wear, people, take it a little, like a step further. They're willing to show us stuff that they wouldn't be able to show us or, or that they wouldn't show us otherwise. Or we have the security clearances to see stuff that other people might not. Um, and it kind of it kind of goes off into just why being a cadet is so valuable. Like West Point provides us with opportunities that I can, I can even begin to describe to you. Um, so we're going to try, um, and me and Chris are going to take you through a little bit of our experiences as cadets at West Point to try and show you just truly how valuable of an experience it is um, for preparing you for careers beyond just the military, but also just making you a better person and a better leader in general. So Chris, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Sam. All right, hey all. Uh, yeah, so West Point provides us a lot of opportunities um, to do things greater than ourselves. Uh, if you look in that first picture in the top left, um, one of these great opportunities is a run we do through New York City, uh, where, they, where a lot of the core cadets go and run from Brooklyn deep into Manhattan, uh, right by the World Trade Center. And so that's one of the great things that we many of us get to do is get to have this opportunity to go run, uh, show our support for the country, uh, show support for his memorial um, and have a lot of fun. And then a couple of these other pictures are some of the military trainings I've done. Um, if you that right picture, uh, that's me during Sandhurst, my uh, freshman year. Uh, it was a really hard competition. It was a lot of fun. We had, um, Sandhurst is kind of a competition where you take a lot of your military training and you put it to use. Uh, so you'll do shooting, you'll do rucking, uh, you'll do running, you do whatever you need to do um, to get the job done. And so it's a lot of fun of putting yourself to the challenge and working as a group and working as a team uh, to do something better. And in that bottom of the picture is me this summer, summer training. Uh, we do something called cadet field training. Uh, it's basically where we kind of go into the field um, and we live in the forest. Uh, and you go out and you do missions, um, you go attack positions, uh, and you learn a lot of new things that you would probably wouldn't learn uh, anywhere else. Go to the next slide. Uh, and so again, this is, if you look in the right picture, uh, this is called, this is at Cadet Leadership Development Training. This is a whole 32 on 32 people combatives. So we're all fighting each other to win. Uh, nowhere else would I ever be able to do this. Um, talking to my friends, they're all like, why would you do this? What is the point of this? And what I tell them is competition, challenge, try to win, fight to win. Uh, and that's what I love. That's one of the opportunities that Westman's given me is that we try to challenge yourself. And if you fail, that's okay. I've, I've failed multiple times here and everything. Um, but you pick yourself up. That's where you learn. You pick yourself up, you dust yourself off, and you keep going. I actually lost this fight um, in this picture. I got pretty brutalized. Um, I was not having a good time. But we had another fight right after, and I was able to learn how to do better, how to fight better. I still lost again. But that's okay. Um, I just getting that leadership challenge. Uh, and then on the left picture, uh, we're obviously situated right above New York City. So I love being able to go to New York City, um, going down. Uh, this is actually right after Army Navy uh, down in New York. And so having those opportunities to go into Army Navy, to go to these big football games and then go explore the city after is amazing. So, oh, go ahead, Sam. Is Sam up now? Giving kind of an overview. Chris, real quick, you know, I mean, we're doing a STEM presentation and you're you're showing us a, a fighting match, but can you kind of, what was some of the 
essential skills that you establish from this. I mean, obviously, perseverance uh, could you continue to do that. But I'm curious to know how does the teamwork and the cadets, how do they use this to build camaraderie um, and improve their ability to be better teammates? Yes, sir. So something we're going to talk about a little later is that group work is everything, um, especially when you go into your later career. Um, you work with the group, you work, the, being able to work in a group is essential. Um, so like a lot of stuff we do about us point is learning how to work together as a team, uh, how to build comedy with each other uh, and stuff like group, uh, group fighting helps. And so it helps build each other's uh, to learn how to work with each other, uh, learn how to work through tough issues, um, which kind of helps us and helps us prepare for the future. So when we go to our future jobs, when we're out of the army or even when we're in the army, uh, be able to work within a group, manage people um, and work through hard problems that happen in our STEM fields uh, and stuff that could come up in the future. Sounds right. Okay, I think Sam is going to share out a few things. Yeah, one thing I just kind of wanted to tack on to what Chris was saying is um, the other thing that, you know, it may seem kind of fighting is a strange way to work on group work, but it helps you think or think critically and stay calm under pressure, how to work through a stressful situation, which it does not matter what you do after graduating high school, graduating college, you're gonna come across stressful times. So being able to, to be able to think and to act, even when you're stressed out, when someone is physically fighting you is, is a pretty useful skill, more so than I think I realized when I first came here. Um, but yeah, I think, one thing that we might have also skipped over a little bit that might be helpful for some of the audience is explaining what West Point is. Um, so West Point is a four-year college, but it's a four-year college with a catch because you don't have to pay tuition in, with money. Um, you pay instead with service. So when me and Chris graduate, we are going to go join the Army as officers, and we owe a certain amount of time in the army, depending on what we do at West Point and then what we do beyond our time in the army. So right now we're college students, but we're also preparing for a career in the military. So that's why we're doing, that's why we're wearing the uniforms. That's why we're doing summer training. We come in, the first thing you do, basic training. Um, so just for a little bit of context for everyone that I think we may have skipped over. So I apologize for that. But I just wanna expound on everything that Chris just said, um, where I'm even a year beyond where he is in, in college. I'm starting to look forward. I'm looking beyond college at this point. And, but that also gives me a little perspective looking backwards. So I can see what I did in high school that prepared me, what I did in college that is now preparing me later on. And the biggest thing I have to emphasize is taking advantage of the opportunities that are provided to you. In high school, there's gonna be clubs and there's gonna be sports. And I encourage every single one of you to join them because that's what's gonna help you be competitive for college. That's gonna help you build skills that will be useful in college. I know the time management that came along with playing three sports and also trying to do well in school was essential when I got here because we're incredibly busy. Um, kind of the, the larger mission that we're serving of trying to get a college education while preparing for the military took, it, it puts a lot of requirements on us. You know, I don't just have academics to worry about. I have to be physically fit. I have athletics to worry about. I have a leadership position here where I'm in charge of 134 people. Like all of that takes a lot of time and the time management that I learned in high school was essential to that. But now moving forward, okay, now I'm taking on even bigger roles here in college. And that is preparing me for when I graduate and I'm in a leadership, of like a real leadership position. Like I am in a job, I'm getting paid. And in the military, we have that extra responsibility of people's lives are quite literally like dependent on my ability to be a good leader. So maybe I've gotten a little too stressful here, maybe a little too down in it, but it really is, 
I've learned so, so much. And I like, I'm very grateful to be here to share this stuff with you guys. But to kind of take you back into some of the other cool things you're going to get exposed to at West Point is, um, I mean, like, look at this. That's a helicopter. We got to ride in that helicopter four times over this past summer. We get to run around with guns in the woods and like pretend we're fighting enemies and stuff. It's a lot of fun. Um, it, it's hard, but you make some of the best friendships you're going to make anywhere. These four guys or these three guys up in the picture on the top right, they're some of my closest friends at West Point. And that's because we got to spend six weeks together out in Alaska, completely on the Army's dime. Um, and we just got to like work with this rocket for six weeks on end. And it was super cool. And then Scott, the person in the middle, he's been a mentor for me ever since then. He's written recommendation letters for me. We stay in touch constantly. And this is almost three years ago now. But he is now a connection that I have made outside of the Army because of my time here at West Point. Up in that left corner, you can see me in pretty visible pain um, coming out of the tear gas chamber. Because yes, we get tear gas here. And it kind of sucks. But that was honestly one of my favorite days here because we came out, we're, la we're like packing and coughing and crying. But all of your classmates are like laughing at you because they just came out. Now they're feeling better. And now they're looking at you also in pain. And you know what? You're going to feel better and you're going to laugh at people coming out after you. Um, but that was also part of a larger leadership detail that we have to complete here where I was put in charge of seven new cadets. I was responsible for taking seven of you guys and making them into cadets, bringing them from a civilian into active duty military. And that was a huge responsibility. It was my way to make my impact on the core at a very small level where it's low risk, low impact, but it was still something. It, it, it's going to be maybe a negative influence. I hope not, but I was able to kind of dip my toe into larger leadership that I'm in now. And then down here on the left side, you're gonna, you see me, never in that right, in the kind of top right of it, you see Goddard Space Flight Center. So that's where uh, Mr. Roman Velasquez came from, uh, is I had the chance to go visit there just a month ago. Um, just completely out of the blue, they were like, hey, do you wanna go to this physics conference down in DC? I said, of course I do. And then I got to go on this super cool inside tour of Goddard Space Flight Center um, that I had a blast at. And I wouldn't have had the opportunity to most likely if I had been anywhere else. And then I think just speaking to some of the girls in the crowd, because yeah, I'm gonna use this moment right now as, as a woman in the military, um, I understand that maybe for a lot of you, you're sitting here thinking, I don't wanna do that. That's not for me. Um, but I would really encourage each of you to, to think about it because I have met some of the most amazing women I will ever meet in my life here. Um, over here in the top left, those are the girls from my B squad. I know none, none of us look like girls in that picture, but I promise they're all girls. Um, and that was right before we launched into a 12 mile march back with 40 pounds on our back. And every single one of us was more than capable of doing it. Same thing with these ladies over here another group of some of my best friends. I rely on them every single day. And then here's me all the way down at the bottom, leading 134 people walking behind me, me leading them in formation. Like, I really wanna like reach out to the women in this audience right now and tell you that maybe like it, it's not for everyone, but don't completely count yourself out because the military is a fantastic opportunity for anyone who joins it. And there is a place for anyone who wants to join. So yeah, Ooh, I bet it goes fast. Um, but yeah, uh, Mr. Mazella, that's kind of what we had to talk about. Do you have any specific questions you'd like us to answer for the crowd? Any of our students have questions for our cadets in regard to the experience? What's it like to be a cadet? Their, the work that they do with astrobotics? Okay. And if you do later, you can always come there. They're, they're going to stay on to uh, Ron's presentation. So Sam and Chris, thank you. Ron, can, I'd like to shift over and, 
and hear about your experiences and what's what's the future of space travel. I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to start my presentation. Okay, do you guys see my screen? Yeah. Perfect. So again, um, I'm excited to be here with you. Uh, we, don't, well, we don't see your screen yet. Oh. What about now? No. Let me go again and share it. Share the screen. There it is. You just got to put it in uh, presentation mode. Yep. Perfect. Now, right. sorry about that. Uh, I'm excited, as I said uh, earlier, about talking to all of you this afternoon. And don't be shy. If you have any questions, we can answer as we go along or do it in the end. So I'm gonna be trying to go through the slides a little bit uh, quicker than I normally do and just to have a little bit of time. But um, I just wanted to start this presentation by showing a short video, uh, the work that we're doing at SAIC that we are trans transforming the boundaries of space. So. It's a short video at the beginning. You can see some of the technologies and some of the areas that we are looking for uh, to hire people in, in terms of digital engineering, digital twins, being able to do everything without even uh, printing out anything, just directly from your computer screen all the way to manufacturing. Some of the advanced technologies that we're developing have uh, direct impact to the work that we're doing for NASA, helping NASA achieve their goals. Uh, I will be providing a current and future missions overview of the work that, that we are doing and the NASA uh, is doing as well. So I'm gonna be hitting in four major areas. I'm gonna be speaking about heliophysics. I'm gonna be talking about our solar system and exploration of our solar system. I'm gonna be talking about the work that we're doing in astrophysics and how important it is. And uh, human space flight. These are the four areas that I'm gonna be targeting uh, this afternoon. First, let's start with the sun. The sun is our nearest star. And it's very important because what happened in the surface of the sun has a direct impact on the quality of life here on Earth. Uh, the sun is basically a giant ball that is burning helium, hydrogen, uh, oxygen, and other uh, gases, and is constantly active. And you see uh, that these uh, flares, solar flares, they're called corona mass ejection. And when one of those flares uh, go off, it sends high energy particles. And those high energy particles travel all over the universe. And some of them go directly towards us. And here you see uh, our blue marble, our earth that is very fragile. However, it's protected. It's protected by our uh, magnetic field. And our magnetic field is like a force field that deflects some of those high energy particles that is coming from us. The sun is uh, almost 94 billion miles away from the sun. 
So if you were to go outside or in any day, the light that you see uh, outside, it left the sun eight minutes and 20 seconds ago. So it takes that long for light who travels very fast uh, to get to the surface of the earth. But going back to the, to the high energy particles, when they hit the magnetic field, they uh, basically uh, generate some energy. And that energy is visualized as the corona uh, borealis the, uh, that you can see in the northern hemisphere or in the southern hemisphere. And that, when you see those dancing lights that are purple, yellow, green, those are high energy particles that are being bombarded by the uh, sun emanating from the sun towards our planet. And it's very important to know that relationship between the sun, the earth, and the rest of our solar system. Now, sun, the sun has a life cycle just like any other star. When it starts, the sun starts as a protostar. Basically, the human analogy will be a fetus. And you can see that it's very dim. Uh, most of the time it's blue color. And as it goes and starts getting older, it goes to the infancy and it's uh, a little bit more brighter, still very blue and it keeps growing, getting older and older. When it reaches to adulthood, it's a yellow, it's a yellowish color. And the temperature changes also. As it gets older, it gets into middle age, then it becomes orange, and then it continues, uh, continues getting older and it becomes a white uh, dwarf. And then when it dies, it becomes a black hole. And that's the life cycle of a star. Now, it takes millions of years uh, to go through that cycle. So don't be scared that our sun is going to die very soon because it's going to be millions and millions of years before that happens. But that is the life cycle of uh, a star, including our own very own star, the sun. Now, this slide, this chart that you see is called, is called the color magnitude diagram. It has a lot of information, but I just want to point out here, if you see my cursor, that uh, blue circle that I put out, that's the sun. I want to highlight there are stars that are much younger than the sun and others are much older than the sun. Also, there are stars like, for example, Betelgeuse. These are super giant stars. Imagine how big they are when the sun, thousands of times larger than our sun. And then you have the giant stars. You have other little stars that are smaller than the sun. Our sun temperature is approximately 6,000 degree Kelvin. Now, uh, that is equivalent to 10,300 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a very, very hot, very hot star. Some of them are even hotter than that. You can see that the young stars are 30,000 Kelvin, which and others are less hard. Uh, but this chart shows that even though that we look at the star, our star, the sun is such a big star, it's just only a small speckle in the entire universe when we look at the universe. And I'll show you other pictures later on. Uh, talking about our solar system, you know, the, the closer plan that the, we have eight planets, the closer one to the sun is Venus, the farthest away from the sun is Uranus. And uh, we also have Pluto. Don't forget about Pluto. I'm a fan of Pluto. Pluto is now been downgraded to a protoplanet. The reason that it's been downgraded to a protoplanet, I don't know if you know, but uh, all the other eight planets have a circular orbit around the, the, uh, the sun. Pluto has a 
an orbit that is completely different. It's, it's basically going from the poles completely in a completely uh, different direction. And it's very small. That was the reason the astronomers downgraded Pluto. But the reason that I bring this image of our solar system is because NASA, for many years, we have been exploring all the planets within our solar system. But one of the planets that has been studied the most is Mars. Mars is our neighbor. And in many areas, Mars is very similar to Earth. Remember that I mentioned about the, the uh, magnetic field? The main difference between Earth and uh, uh, Mars is that Mars at some point lost the magnetic field. B because it lost its magnetic field, it lost its protection against the sun. And it basically the sun has eroded the atmosphere. So right now there is no atmosphere uh, on Mars because of the energetic particles emanating from the sun. Uh, so here you see a picture, a picture of the Curiosity rover that uh, took this picture, uh, has been stitched, stitched that means it has been put together uh, between many, many pictures that the rover has been taken over a long period of time. And uh, this panoramic image shows a hill that has been nicknamed Bolivar. So you can see here the hill, you can see the sand dunes, you can see the sand ridges, you can see rocks. It's, a, it's like a desert in many areas, in many remote areas of earth, we have what is called Mars analog. And that's where we practice some of the times uh, digging for minerals and, and we practice uh, resources mining just in preparation. So when we go to Mars or beyond or the moon, uh, let me show you another image from Mars. You can see here the surface of the Mars in a, in a more closer aspect. And you can see here the Ingenuity helicopter the Ingenuity helicopter performed the first ever power flight on another planet. And uh, basically the Ingenuity helicopter was part of the Mars 2020 mission where the uh, Perseverance rover carried the Ingenuity helicopter basically in the belly of the rover and then it birthed the uh, the helicopter, it moved away and then the helicopter became exposed. Now we have performed over 33 power flights uh, of the helicopter studying the interaction between a helicopter and the rover. And how can we in the future take advantage of uh, maybe a swarm of different helicopters flying around Mars, uh, working in tandem with rovers giving us a much better perspective of the surface of Mars or maybe other planets, even beyond our solar system way in the future. So it's very exciting, all the things that we're doing around the solar system. Another thing that I want to mention about the solar system here, you see the eight planets and you see Pluto here uh, as a protoplanet, but we, NASA is, is doing searching for uh, what are called Earth analogs. Earth analogs are planets on other stars that are very similar to planet Earth. And one of the conditions that is very important in order for us to discover Earth analogs uh, are the condition that it must be within the habitable zone. In order to be within the habitable zone, there is one critical factor that is very important is that water needs to be in liquid form. So in order there to be life as we know it on earth, you need water. Water is the basic of uh, life uh, for us. So depending on the parent star, 
you could be closer to the star if the star is much smaller or if it's a star that is much bigger than Earth, then it could be farther away. But that distance is determined in terms of the solar radiation, in terms of the amount of light that, that uh, hits the planet. There are multiple factors, but in order to be a, a terrestrial planet outside on another star needs to be within what we call the habitable zone. NASA has a fleet of satellites. Since its inception, NASA has launched over 250 robotic missions. That's now counting you know, the Apollo program, all the landings on the moon. These are robotic missions that we have launched to study the Earth, also to study the, the sun uh, in our solar system, to study our planetary system, uh, different planets to study Mars and astrophysics to study the cosmo and how uh, you know space is expanding and growing. So this is a, a, a depiction of all the missions, not all of them. These are the most important missions that we have created a collage. One of those missions that is very important that is in this little corner here, uh, let me see if I find it uh, here, is the James Webb Space Telescope. The James Webb Space Telescope is a marble of technology that we were able to build in the last almost two decades. The, is the, is the successor of the Hubble Space Telescope. The Hubble Space Telescope has a mirror of uh, approximately uh, eight feet in diameter. The James Webb Space Telescope has a, a mirror, an optical mirror that is 21 feet in diameter. So big that for us, in, uh, in order to launch it into space, we had to build it in segments. So that's why you see the image, the image of the telescope and the mirrors are you know, uh, in, uh, in segments. This telescope, we call it like the time machine because it could go and look way, way back, almost at the beginning of the universe. Let me share with you some of the pictures that James Webb Space Telescope has been able to take. This is a cosmic tarantula. You know, astronomers love giving names to some of the celestial objects. That's why we have all the constellations, Sagittarius, you know, and Gemini and all the other constellations. So if you close your eyes and you kind of squint, you could see maybe a resemble of a tarantula, spider. You can see those arms uh, that is stretching. This is a region that is 161 light years away. It seems very far for us, but taking in consideration that the universe is 93 billion light years away. When we talk about 161 light, uh, thousand years, uh, light years, it's very, very, it's our neighbor. It's our neighbor uh, uh, in, 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 uh, in the corner. So you can see here dots. Some of those dots are, you can see light blue, some of them are white, some of them are orange, some of them are like gases. You can see uh, this filaments. These are called filaments. And these are gases that are uh, around the, the uh, this region. And those are basically forming new stars. That's why you see all these little dots or stars that are either protostars that are forming in the process of being formed or young stars that are in the infancy of their life cycle. This is another image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope initially in 1995 and now has been retaken using the James Webb Space Telescope. 
These are the pillars of creation. The reason that they're called the pillars of creation is because this is a nursery, nursery of stars, nursery of galaxy. They are constantly being discovered, new stars, new galaxy. When astronomers look at this image, they look at each of the pixels, each of the little dots comp uh, comprising this image. And they have found more galaxies and more stars than any other region in the universe. So these are some of the things that technology has enabled us to take a look at the universe. And even though that we think that planet Earth is such big, we are only a grain of salt in this big ocean called the universe. Now, let me continue a little bit because I can talk forever about some of this. Now I'm gonna talk about human spaceflight. This is a picture of me at Kennedy Space Center and behind me is the Artemis One rocket. This rocket was supposed to be launched initially in, in early September. This picture was taken one week before that initial launch. However, when this is a very complex rocket and just before uh, when we were getting ready to launch, uh, we detected a hydrogen leak in the umbilical cord that fills the main rocket and it had to be scrubbed, basically had to be canceled. This mission is gonna be a very important mission because after many years, we are going back to the moon and we are going to go there and not only to go there and come back. I'll talk a little bit more about the moon in a second, but let me first show you uh, the profile for this launch. By the way, don't miss September 15. Remember September 15, what's gonna happen September 15? In a couple of weeks, we are going to uh, do another attempt to launch the Artemis One mission. It's gonna be a night launch. It's gonna be at 12.06 a.m. So when this rocket takes off, it's gonna lit the entire sky. When the rocket takes off, it for the first uh, minute or so, it's powered by a liquid fuel tank and uh, two solid rockets. Those two solid rockets are going to separate and it's going to, they're going to fall in the ocean and we're gonna retrieve them and we're gonna reuse them again. But this, the liquid rocket is gonna continue. It's gonna burn for six minutes. It has over six million liters of hydrogen. That means that the, the consumption is one million liter per minute. That's the consumption in terms of fuel that this rocket has. And uh, once it's, the capsule is separates from the main rocket, the liquid rocket, it's gonna go into a hollow orbit towards the moon. It's gonna go and you can see that it's gonna separate and it's gonna arrive to the moon and it's going to circle the moon two and a half times. During those two and a half times, we're gonna release some CubeSats that are gonna do some experimentation on the surface of the moon. We're gonna take measurements. We're gonna take, we're gonna check the communication system. We're gonna check all the different subsystems of this complex mission. And after those two and a half uh, orbits, we're gonna come back and we're gonna head again towards Earth and we're gonna circle Earth a couple of times and it's gonna land in the Pacific Ocean near California. And you can see here that the capsule opens the parachutes and is gonna land in the ocean. And then uh, with the help of the, our army and the National uh, the, uh, uh, Coast Guard and others, are, we're gonna retrieve the capsule and we're gonna bring it back. So this is a test run for Artemis One. There is not gonna be uh, no passengers. 
we're going to be able to perform all the different maneuvers that we need to do without passengers. For future missions, we're going to have astronauts uh, go along for the ride as well. Juan, can you give the students the date again? Because I think you said September 15th. Uh, no, I'm sorry. It's November 15th. I'm sorry. If I said September okay. 15th, my apologies. And what, and what, and what time? It's at 12.06 a.m., basically a few minutes past midnight. Eastern Standard Time? Uh, Eastern Standard Time, yes. So I'm sure that the local, the, the local news and some of the local channels uh, most likely will broadcast the launch. But I'm going to switch now to the moon. And uh, we're going back to the moon, but not just to return back. We are going to begin living off the moon. We're going to be creating some lunar habitats. We're going to be creating some, uh, uh, we're going to grow plants uh, on the moon by having some green uh, places. Obviously, there are going to be some manufacturing and some uh, uh, structures need to be constructed because of that. We're going to have fuel depots because we're going to be using the, mu the moon as a launching point for going to Mars and other distant locations. So with this manufacturing in the moon, uh, mining in the moon, just like the cadets, Sam and Chris uh, uh, described to us, we are working with different universities, different institutions in order to develop the technology that we need. But in addition to that, there are gonna be uh, new disciplines that are gonna be created, digital engineering. We're gonna be able to uh, augmented reality and uh, virtual reality. Nowadays, they exist, but it's gonna be much more important. It's gonna be more relevant. People are gonna be working you know, and they're gonna have jobs uh, on the moon, but working from earth. So that's something that we have not been able to do now. Uh, so there is a huge opening for new technologies in order to enable the future that, that NASA wants. I, I'm gonna close my presentation with, uh, with this quote, and then I'm gonna take uh, any questions that you may have because uh, I love this quote from uh, Dr. Robert Goddard. And it says, it is difficult to say what's impossible for the dream of yesterday is the hope of today and the reality of tomorrow. So my advice to you guys is never stop dreaming, continue dreaming, dream big, because your dreams are gonna be the reality of tomorrow. Back to you, Chris. Thank you. That was wonderful. A lot of great insight. Do you have any question? Come on, don't be shy. Uh, you might have to come over and stand in front of the owl. What's your name? <laughs> Hi, Audrey. Where are you from? Hi, Conroga. So, how did you become an astrophysicist? Oh, well, okay, just to be, I am an engineer. My doctorate mm -hmm. degree is in systems engineering. However, I work very closely with astrophysicists. And oh, yeah. uh, so there are my buddies. Um, <laughs> in order to study either engineering and astrophysicists, uh, or astrophysics, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, math and science that you have to take. Uh, there are... Uh, many great universities throughout the United States, including in New York, uh, that have uh, astronomy and astrophysicists as there are some of the, the, the disciplines that they teach. Uh, and so if you're interested, if you like looking at the stars, if you are interested in what's out there, my, my advice is study astronomy or astrophysicists. Thank you. What other questions? Come on up.
How will space directly impact our lives in the coming years? Wow, that's a very, very good question. Thank you for asking. Space is closer than you think. A lot of the technology that are developed for, uh, for space applications are used. So let me give you one simple example. Before the pandemic, when we were sick, most of the time there were, you know, the thermometers, there were the thermometers that you put on your mouth or that you touch or something. Now you are seeing a lot of the, those infrared thermometers that you basically you bring closer to your forehead and you can detect the temperature. That's a development that it was first designed for space applications because you cannot touch the things that you're trying to measure the temperature. Uh, some of the temperature of the stars that we, that, that we know now, we cannot go there and touch it. We use technology that is called infrared in order to detect the temperature of those planets. And that technology has been used to create thermometers that nowadays help uh, save our lives, know that when we have fever. That's only one example. Uh, when you fly in an airplane, many times, you, when you look at the airplanes, you have noticed, I don't know if you've noticed that the, the winds, now they have like a tail at the tip of the wing has a little bit of, of a kind of bent uh, upwards. Well, that technology was uh, researched at NASA in order to improve the fuel consumption in airplanes. And I can go on and on. Velcro is one that, that everybody uses. Uh, even, even the ball pen was designed for space applications and now it becomes ubiquitous. You use it in an everyday life. So some people question, why are we investing money in space? Well, it comes back to us in the form of new technology and better quality of life here on earth. Any other questions? Anybody have any questions about travel to Mars? Because that's what they're working on next. Well, now that you mentioned, let me tell you about traveling to Mars. Many people don't know, but in order to travel to Mars, you have to wait until Mars is closest to Earth. And that's when you can launch a spacecraft or a rocket to Mars. You cannot launch it when it's farther away from Earth because it will never get there. So, and it takes... Uh, it takes almost a year to, to, to uh, with the current technology that we have for a rocket to reach Mars. And then it takes Mars uh, a, almost a year to go around the sun in order to come back again and be close to Earth. Remember, if you launch, if you're traveling to Mars, you cannot... If you travel to Mars, you just cannot, oops, I don't want to come. Let me, let me go back. If you go to Mars, you have to be on the surface of Mars for at least a year until you can actually return back to Earth. And it takes you a year, uh, approximately a year to come back. So any trip to Mars is going to be three years. That's as fast as we can do it. And some of the problems is with the radiation, the solar radiation. Remember that I mentioned high energy particles? Well, while you're traveling from Earth to Mars, you have to protect yourself. You have to be shielded. So those high energy particles cannot hit your body and create you know, mutations in your body. So uh, there is a lot of things that we need to take in consideration in order to travel to Mars. But the good thing is that we, we know and we are uh, coming up with technologies that can keep us safe and uh, new propulsion systems and uh, new rockets that will enable us to do that trip. Does anybody have any questions about potential careers in the future with space travel or anything? Okay. Dr. Roman Velasquez, thank you so much. This was very insightful. I don't, I don't know if Sam and Chris are still on because I know they're college students. They may have had to um, go to class. Is that, 
Are Sam and Chris, are you still on? Yeah, I, I see them. There are, there are with us. Do you have any questions for the West yeah. Point cadets? Okay. We want to thank you so much for sharing your expertise, your insights, potential careers of the future, where are we going with space travel, and the experiences as being cadets at West Point, as well as all the essential skills you have to have, you know, working in teams and leadership development, networking, and all those kind of great things. Um, for our schools and not just our students, you know, West Point and SAIC are obviously partners. SAIC provides us um, STEM mentors. So if there is a program that you have at your school and, and you want to connect with somebody from SAIC, I mean, obviously they're all over the world, um, but then would probably be a virtual connection. Um, we can also do that, you know, and if there's a certain project you have, and that you want to tap in to experts in those fields, we will do that for you as well. Okay. Well, listen, we're going to sign off. Thank you so much. Can we give our guests a big round of applause? Thank you. 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 Thank you.